Hello, visibility hackers, and welcome to today's episode. I'm Molly from the Visibility Hacking Team, and as per usual, it's an absolute pleasure to have you guys here with me. We go live every Monday, 2 p.m. Eastern, with the live show to share what we're doing with connection machines. And this week in the visibility hacking movement, I... I hit my head against the wall a few times in frustration. Um, there's two different things that are kind of that I'm kind of dealing with at the moment. On the one side is guests. Um, guests are fantastic. I love them. Don't get me wrong. Um, but sometimes follow up with guests can be a little bit um, difficult. So that has been something that I've been trying to figure out how to better handle. And I think I'm I'm falling on the part where I may need to hire uh, an assistant to handle a lot of that guest interaction. Um, even though I love being the one who gets to connect with my guests, who gets to, um, you know, bring them onto the show and all that kind of stuff. But uh, the follow up afterwards can sometimes take three, four, five times as long as um, as the, the interview itself uh, to try and get those follow up assets. So that was something I was struggling with this week, but I'm hoping that by end of the month, I will hopefully have a solution for that. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I've been dealing with in the movement is formats. We've been talking a lot about formats. I told you about the big, the big gig, right? So the formats, I like my brain just keeps going a, a hundred miles an hour when it comes to coming up with formats and frameworks and, and things like that, that work within um, the connection machine realm. Uh, and it's been it's been rather fruitful, I have to say. Um, but I have been stuck in that creative idea generating uh, state. So hopefully in the next, well, hopefully, I'm putting it on my list that in the next couple days, I'm really going to focus on um, on systematizing the crazy stuff that's been coming out of this brainstorming session and, uh, and actually start being able to move forward with putting that information into a format that you guys can actually start learning from. Uh, because there's no point in coming up with these brilliant ideas if I can't find a way to communicate them out to you guys. So that, that is that. Shall we dive into today's quote? <laughs> Our quote of the week for this week is smart people learn from everything and everyone. Average people from their experiences and stupid people already have all the answers. From one of my favorite philosophers, Socrates. So I want you to think about it this way. I want you to look out into the world and realize that everyone is an expert in their field. Everyone is an expert in what they do, just like you are as well. But when we step off of our pedestal and we come down from our world of ego and we realize that we, we might feel like we're the expert in something, but we can turn to someone else and learn from their expertise as well. The story of Socrates is that he would actually walk around the, the city squares and the towns and the streets and he would say, the potter is the expert in pottery. There is something I can learn. The artist is an expert in art. There is something I can learn from them. Take that mindset, my friends, because when we learn from others, our worlds will absolutely change. Let's get into today's episode. Hello, hello, visibility hackers. This set of uh, this episode is all about interviews, the fact that we can learn from others around us, the kind of knowledge that we can gain when we bring experts onto our show and we're able to drill them with questions. There are different styles of interviewing. There are different ways of getting the answer out of your guests. There are different ways of getting the guests onto your shows in the first place. And we're going to talk about all of that stuff today. I know in my own journey, building my business and building my platform, building my stage, building my authority, a lot of that rested in the, the interviews that I was able to do. 
And yes, of course, I come into the entrepreneurial world with a bit of a journalism background. Um, so I did get a lot of expertise and a lot of training and a lot of experience interviewing people in that different realm. But hey, I'm here to share what I learned with you guys so that you can just jump straight into being a superstar interviewer. <laughs> So the thing, the big thing I want you guys to think about today when it comes to interviewing people is first, I want you to come up with a list of your, your dream people that you want to interview. Now, your dream people that you want to interview are not just going to be celebrities. They're not just going to be people that you selfishly want to interview. You need to also think about your responsibility to your audience. Who are the guests that can bring the most value to your audience? Those are the guests that I want you to put down on your list. Brainstorm as many as you can, but remember, each and every one of those guests needs to serve some sort of value to your people. So create a chart. On one column, have all the names of the people that you want to bring on. In the second column, make sure that you qualify them as people who will bring value to your audience. So have a second column where you're looking for that. Then I want you to do what's called a pre-frame. This is where I want you to think of guest number A who will serve value, yes or no, yes. Moving on to third question then is what is the frame? What is the, how are you going to walk your people, build the bridge, um, so your people go from their lack of knowledge in the subject area to understanding and being ready to take on the information that your guest is sharing. This is what we call the pre-frame. I like to honestly think of it as literally a bridge from where your customers and where your listeners are before the interview starts to where they need to be before to, to actually get the most out of the interview. So this is usually like an introductory paragraph. This is where you talk about the little bit of bio that your, um, that your guest has, a little bit of authority statements, but then you want to talk about why it's important. So today's guest on the live show today is RJ Ahmed. And the reason I want you to listen to him and the reason why I want you to hear what he's sharing today is because he has interviewed so many many incredible inspirational entrepreneurs. That is his experience. That is his realm of expertise. And I want you to have the opportunity to learn from him. That is a very simple preframe. You can do a much larger, more involved preframe that would involve more biographical information. Some people do skits. Some people have um, pre-roll, uh, pre-recorded things that they put in as their intros. Uh, and some guests will actually come with their own intros or intro reels as well. So there's, there's a lot going on. But basically, your homework, my friends. Your homework is to first list off all of the people that you think could bring value to your audience. Second is to make sure that you're qualifying them. Are they going to provide value to your audience? And it's not just a selfish reason to get on a, a conversation with them. And then the third thing is think about how you contextualize that expertise to your audience. How do you build the bridge that gets your audience to mentally pay attention to what's happening in your interview? Pretty cool stuff, I have to say. So there is a lot going on today, but we're just going to dive straight in to our interview with the interviewer himself, RJ Ahmed. Of the, what it, what feels to me like a million people you've interviewed, how many people have you actually formally done interviews with? It's actually around 75 so far. Wow. Crazy. That is, that is incredible. So tell me about who you were when you were stepping into that first interview, when you were sitting there and you decided, Hey, I'm going to do interviews. Tell me about who you were, where you were, what was your business like? Tell me about that. So it was actually, I was on the verge of affiliate marketing. I was doing affiliate marketing at that time. Uh, my very first unofficial uh, interview of the show was with Alex Elliott. You know, I got her on the show, not was the official part of the show, but you know, that's how I actually started to interview entrepreneurs. 
because she was doing the JV launch of our one group away challenge. And I was like, I, I want to start interviewing Alex because she was like, she was pretty cool. She was awesome. And I was like, I have to do it. I have to start somewhere because not only that was my very first interview, it was the very first time I was doing live in front of camera. So I was actually nailing down my objections and the objections I had in my life initially was being on camera because I might not look pretty. And the second thing was, uh, you know, had the fear of public speaking. So that was the biggest two objections. So I was like, this is, I think, the best time to do it. And it was actually like 4 a.m. I had one hand free, not proper lighting, not proper mic, not proper camera. But I was like, I have to do it at this moment to do it rough. Had no idea, but I was like, oh, let's do it. So it was actually uh, in September or October 2019, you know, the unofficial interview, I must say. And then I started to feel like, okay, I got some other amazing entrepreneurs as well. And then I was like, rather than doing general Facebook Live, what if I name it as a show and start to get entrepreneurs like that? So that's how it everything turned up for me. Yeah. And you're when you build a show, you're connecting to an audience of your experts that you're bringing on as guests and to an audience of people who are consuming your content. They're watching those interviews. So how do you we're, we're going to ask I'm going to ask you questions about each of those groups. So first, how do you make sure that you're serving those experts? Because if you step into these interviews and you want these big names or you look up to certain people in the marketing space and you you want them to be on your show, how do you actually get them to notice you if you're just starting out? What would you recommend? So very first thing is you have to create your existence. Yeah. people need to know about like that you exist and you know existence is something out there that could be positive or negative both so think about if someone you like you know you have to make sure you create existence and in a positive way you know yeah. it could be in any way like helping other people out as well like be most engaging out there so like for me out there obviously when i started out i was super engaging my very first official guest of the show was spencer makeup you know so I was following him from quite a while. He was like one of the guys that I was watching in affiliate marketing since he crushed it. So I was help, uh, you know, helping his community, posting content. Like I was doing all of those stuff so that he feels like I exist in his community. So before I reach out to him. So that was the initial first thing I did. So the number one thing what I really recommend everyone out there is making sure you go ahead and serve. Don't be one of those people who are watching others serving, watching other hanging out with those people out there because they're not in their comfort zone because they're out of it. Don't be in the comfort zone out there, especially when you know you can build the relations, you have the potential. And on the other side, when we talk about like how, for me personally, how I was able to serve, it is something actually like, think about if a guest arrived to your house. Number one thing that which is important is the experience. Yeah. I make sure I make their experience better because that is actually something that might lack uh, for some people when they get them on the show. They ask generic questions. They don't know how to connect one question to the other. They don't know how to start the show. They don't know how to end the show. So it becomes boring for them, for the audience, for the host as well. You know, it just overreact and all of those stuff. But yeah, when you make these experiences better, they have a good experience. They remind you who you are. They get in conversation with you later on post interviews. They potentially do JVs with, uh, you know, with you as well on your projects or you help them out as well on some things. So experience is something out there which is super important uh, to, you know, go ahead and build that relationship when they get on your show. I love that idea because it truly personalizes the experience. In the online yep. space, we're constantly talking about automating your business, getting your time back, but we can't do that to when we're sacrificing that connection to our people. And so like sending little voice memos to people, connecting with them, checking in on what they're doing, being part of their world, celebrating the things that they're putting out there is a great way for people to get started, regardless of how big your audience is, which is super cool. Now, how do you yeah. serve, make sure that you're serving value to your audience? We we can serve value to our guests. Awesome. They get on our show. Now they now we're sitting there and we're like, all right. We got to create some kind of content that's going to be of value. What goes through your head when you're thinking about that? 
So in terms of the value for the audience out there, if, you know, first of all, you have that stage. So you have the ability to ask the common ground questions that most people have, especially the, your audience could have, you know, with a particular guest. So what I usually do is, obviously, I I know because since I've been the part of that audience as well, you know, since I follow them as well as an audience, so I know the kind of the questions that people could possibly have. So why not myself asking that question? But I make sure that I don't ask in a way which sounds generic. So I, you know, sometimes I mix it up and someone is replying and I'm like, you know, that's cool. And then I get it up as a follow-up question, but the question still remains the same. So that's why how what initially happened is the on, uh, audience's questions get answered, first of all, which is important because they wanted to get more ahas, you know, and they get it just because these are the type of people they want to know about. Like if they want to learn affiliate marketing, then Spencer Megum, and then, you know, offer then Steve Larson, like it goes like that. So they're getting their questions answered how they it wanted to be. And then I do it live because I want my audience to engage to my guests as well. So, you know, uh, due to that particular way, they also get, you know, questions answered as well. So that's how I serve my audience initially. So you're you're gathering your questions not only from your perspective of being an audience member, but also from the other audience members in their in their environments and whatnot. That's that's fantastic. So and we're also making sure that we're not asking generic questions. So that yeah. totally answers my next question: Was do you have any other tips about coming up with great questions um, when you're when you're asking people on your show? Yeah, so the very first thing is make sure that you listen to some of the interviews in the past. It is mm -hmm. actually important to do that because, uh, you know, you don't need to overlap questions every single time if the question has already been answered before. What could potentially happen is if someone have already answered a question, there might be an other you know, follow-up question you, you could have in your mind now. Like, you know, it could happen potentially. You know, yeah. if you have to listen to some previous interviews, you know, it is something like that, you know, if someone interviewed Russell Brunson and that person asking like, hey, you know, how you got started in the space. So like, if a person know how Russell already got started, it is not a common sense, you know, for you to do actually, actually do it. Second thing, what you need to make sure is you make it personalized, you know, you add some things out there that is relatable to them a lot. I remember uh, I asked Steve, like, hey, have you ever thought about writing your own book? And then he was like on and on talking about his story, like how he got into Expert Secrets book. He's planning to write multiple books. He loved that I asked that question. So if you make it more personalized around them, what they love on a personal level as well, it creates that um, emotional attachment with you. Uh, that is also uh, important as well. And the third thing which is important is when I say generic questions, like what's the best book you read? What's the best yeah. advice you're going to give you 20 years old? If you want to know the answers about those things, you can get that answers a ton of time. Just watch their previous interviews. Yeah. So you don't need to ask that questions again. So these are like my top three uh, tips in order to improvise your stuff out there. And when you do it repetitively, you get better. You know, I got better like after doing like a ton of interviews. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I love that. Oh, this is this is a great interview. I love what you're putting down here because people need to start getting out there. And first of all, getting over their fear of being on camera. So if you're afraid of being on camera, my friends, just go on a podcast or whatever, but start connecting. And yeah, yeah. nobody's perfect when they start. We get better as we go through. I remember one of, oh, I have this piece of feedback from someone I, I interviewed a few times. Um, and I really, really looked up to this person. I still do. Um, and I finished an interview with them and they were like, Hey, so let's, uh, you got some feedback for you. I was like, Oh, feedback from my guest. That's weird. But it's something I've started to try and implement more is like keeping those connections going and asking for feedbacks constantly so that I can get better watching my old yeah. interviews, watching other people's interviews. And the feedback this person gave me almost broke my heart. And I almost wanted to like cry and never do this again. And it, the feedback was all in relation to the intros I gave people. Mm. I didn't do any research. I didn't care about filling people up with their, res like introducing people with their resume. I just got super excited to interview people. So I would just share that excitement and that should be good enough. If I'm excited, you should be excited. That's how this should work. And I, I was crushed when the feedback was, you have to stop that. You have to start 
introducing people for the accomplishments that they've put out there. That's what establishes your guest's authority, but it also yeah. establishes your authority as the interviewer. So that was my biggest learning moment when it came to starting interviews in my own world. What was the biggest learning moment or the biggest change that you learned going through all of these interviews? So the biggest change actually came up was that it was super realistic for me to build relations if I find a, a way to connect with them on a personal level. You know, I interviewed Josh Fawdy on the show. You know, a lot of people in the space know Josh Fawdy because of the way he built relationships with a lot of people in the space. So he said uh, on, the, on our show, like, hey, dude, you know, one of the most important thing why... I was able to connect with Russell Brunson was not on a business level. It's like way far ahead on a business perspective. He was able to relate to me on a personal level mm -hmm. and all of those things. So when you realize that you could connect with those people out there on a personal level, uh, when we talk about personal level, I was talking with Marley uh, a couple of weeks back. She loves food. So I was talking about food with her because yeah. she's the thing, that is the thing that is relatable to her at the moment. I could open up a conversation. I could talk about all of those things all the time with her. So if you find those things out there, it's easier for you, for you to do it. The second thing is, as you uh, as you mentioned, like what was the guest who gave you the tip about that is controlling your excitement. You know, mm -hmm. if I go back and watch my interview in the past, I was super excited. I was like out of the world excited out there. And later on, I started to control my excitement a bit of it because I don't want to be look like another fan who is getting th those people on the podcast. I want to show respect. I want to show my gestures. I want to show everything out there to the guests. Like I respect them. I admire them and all of those things. But it doesn't mean I have to dance over and over again. Yeah. So that is important. So how you control yourself is like, think about it. If you're meeting someone out there for the first time in person, do you want to be super weird guy out there? Or you want to be a guy who looks better, who, who knows yeah. how to talk, who knows how to do conversation. So when I started to think about that, uh, you know, the way that I started to do interview got different. The way I started to reach out to people out there got different. How I communicate got different. So these were like my biggest learnings out there initially. And that helped me so much like moving forward. So yeah, like that was the biggest breakthrough. I love it. I love it. So we we briefly touched on the word book. And I know I know I want to touch on this a little bit more. We create interviews, we create a ton of content, and then the content question comes up. What do you do with that content afterwards? So my question to you is, how do you, do you repurpose your content? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. What are you doing with it? Um, and and what is, what is, where does the content go and what do you do with it after it goes live? Well, yeah, so there are actually so many ways initially. I actually repurposed it in, in the video content or a podcast and other form of formats. One of the way how I actually did that was with my book, which was decades and days. You know, I took the interviews, I took their takeaways because they were expert in different fields, and then I converted it into a book. Um, I was thinking about it, uh, the name of it from a long, long time. But one of my friends who was also one of the guests of my show as well, he told me the name like decades and days. I was like, dude, that is a pretty great name. And, you know, then I came up with the subtitle of it, like the book to learn from decades of experience of successful entrepreneurs on how to build yourself and your business online. I was like, this is, this is the perfect tagline for that, 100%. Because here's the thing, all of them were experts. All of them had their own point of views around different things. And one of the guys asked me a question, can a $10 million per year guy can learn from that book? I was like, yes. And, and the book there was Dave Woodward, like who is the CEO of ClickFunnels. He have, he have different thought processes. There's a different guy who sold an eight-figure company, uh, which was solely around BAs. He knows more systems than other people potentially. So I was like, yeah, a $10 million per year guy could learn a thing or two for sure, 100%. So that's how I actually came up with uh, with decades and days. And when I said about that, and when I uh, presented that repurposing way of me doing that, in ClickFunnels event, they were like, dude, is that even possible of doing that with interviews? Like, this is crazy. So that was actually a game, cha game changer out there. So yeah. Oh. Oh, that's amazing. Well, then that's the also the perfect segue. How can people get decades, decades of brilliant information out of the brains of entrepreneurs in your book? How can they get a hold of it? So you guys can go to decadesindaysbook.com 
so, and you can get your copy out there over there for sure. Amazing. RJ, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been an absolute blast. Thank you so much, Molly. Hey, RJ, question for you putting together a whole slew of different people that we want to reach out to to be guests on our show. And I figured, since you're the expert on getting guests and being able to interview people, how do you think I should start off if I'm just going to start with a cold message? I've been uh, warming up the audience a little bit. I've been warming them up, serving them value. What do you think I should put in the actual message to them? What's your advice? That is actually a great question. So one of the initial tips which I give to everyone out there and the script that I have, which works like crazy for a lot of people out there, is I have a script and it goes something like, hey, I have a show called Dash, your show name, where I interview blank, you know, your target guest, like for me, like is entrepreneurs, who are super awesome in the niches. I've interviewed, if you had interviewed any previous guests that are relatable to those particular people, for example, let's say for Catherine, Marley Jackson is more relatable, uh, or Myron Golden or Steve Larson, that you could talk about the previous guests you have interviewed if you have interviewed someone. If not, then you could be transparent and be talking about, hey man, you know, this is my very first uh, show episode and I want you uh, to have you as my first guest. And then let them know the time window. I want to have you for 30 minutes. If you're good to go, send me your calendar and I will book you up. And then you also say to them, you're giving them multiple opportunities and you're talking to them about that, hey, uh, send me your calendar, I will book you up or let me know who is the best person to make it happen. So the script goes something like, hey, I have a show called Interviews with Entrepreneurs where I interview entrepreneurs who are super awesome in their niches. I've interviewed multiple seven eight figure entrepreneurs, included my guest. I want to have you on my show for 30 minutes. Uh, send me your calendar and I will book you up or let me know who is the best person to make it happen. Looking forward to your response. So this is how you actually book a guest. Uh, regardless if that person is in your circle or if you're nurturing them and you can reach out to them to book them up in any way possible because this is giving them multiple options to book it up on your show. Now that is brilliant. He literally gave you guys a script. So I, I'm giving you more homework, guys. Your homework now is to go use that script. Get your very, very first guest on your show. At least get them booked. At least start the conversation. And then join us in the Visibility Hackers group. Share who, what that experience was like. Did they say yes? Are they going to be on your show? When they're ready to be on your show, definitely post about your episode in the group because we want to check it out. We want the community to check it out and we want to celebrate your successes. Now let's get in to today's top 10. All right, today we are talking about 10 ways to prepare for an interview. I know interviews can be really overwhelming feeling, so we're going to break it down. And these are the 10 things that you definitely need to think about before you start your next live show, before you have your next guest on, all of that fun stuff. So we are going to talk about the 10 things you need um, in order to succeed and uh, with your interview. So let's get going. Number 10 on the list is to make sure that you set up your space. This, I've talked about this before, if you've been a visibility hacker for a while, we talk about the quality of your background and what we see in the background. But in this step, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed with having to create a whole new backdrop or a whole new set. None of that is as important as setting up your space and being mindful of background noise. I know it's kind of fun to see the kids pop their heads into some interviews. It adds a little bit of charm, but it also, the noise of the kids in the background or the dogs barking or the cars going by um, is, can be really distracting. Most importantly, though, this is really important if you're doing interviews in the public. Um, I used to work at a bunch of co-working spaces, uh, and but they were really, really noisy. So the overall quality of my interviews was not up to par. Um, it was really distracting. So I want you to pay attention to making sure that your background isn't noisy and isn't distracting. 
Number nine on the list is to time block. So this means that you're going to make sure that you are dedicating the right amount of time to communicate um, and communicating that with your guest. Um, I know with this show in particular, we have a set time limit. We try to keep our episodes under an hour, but it can be really, really um, distracting and difficult on the production end when we have guests who take our 15-minute interview slots and turn them into a one-hour conversation. That makes it a lot more work on our end to try and chop that interview down without losing great content, um, and it doesn't, it doesn't, necessarily make me want to bring that guest back because of that extra work. So what that means for me as someone who's going to be interviewing people, it means that I need to pay more attention to time blocking and communicating that to our guests as well. So you can do that too and save yourself a ton of headaches. Number eight is research. So make sure that you are reading up on your guests ahead of time. What are they known for? What are they great at? What are things that you can ask them that are unique and different and exciting? Remember when Ahmed was talking about, or RJ was talking about um, asking interesting questions. That comes from doing the initial research ahead of time. So make sure you're doing that research. Number seven on the list is core questions. I suggest that you write out a handful of core questions ahead of time. What are those questions that are going to help answer those big burning questions that your people might have? I recommend doing three to five of these. You may or may not get to all of these questions in your interview, but I've had a few interviews that, um, there's like two different things that can happen in an interview at the most basic level. One, your guests will just ramble on. They will just keep talking. It'll be great. There are actually three things that could happen. So that's one. Second one is you can get into this great back and forth conversation where you don't need questions. You can just keep going back and forth with your guest. Fabulous. Third thing that can happen, which I, it happened to me and I was not prepared for it once. Um, the guest just gave one or two sentence answers and that was it. So we needed to fill up a 20 minute uh, interview time block, uh, but the guest literally answered in sometimes one or two word sentences and that was really difficult. So having those guiding questions will at least make sure that you cover your bases and you get good quality information. It helps you take control of the pathway of the conversation conversation if for any reason your guest kind of throws you off a little bit. <laughs> Number six is to identify the intangibles, the shared values between you and your guest, you and your audience, you and your guest's audience, etc., etc. We want to build that sense of community and it comes not from thinking about, oh, we're trying to get X number of new subscribers, but instead thinking about those shared common values. People who I interview, for example, are deeply passionate about entrepreneurs and how the, how entrepreneurs can literally change the world. That is that shared value I have with all of them. And so look for what that shared value is between your community and you and your movement and your guests and their movements and so on and so forth. Finding those places of connection not only will make it easier for your guests, your potential guests to say, yes, they want to come on your show, but but also it helps um, create a better interview overall, I think. Number five is having a connection call. And I know I am fully guilty of not doing enough of these. But having a connection call is a great idea to make sure that you and your guest are on that same page before you actually start recording your interview. So a connection call is where you might jump on a call with um, a potential guest who you've never met or interacted with. Remember when RJ was suggesting that we ask for recommendations from our guests of who we could also interview. So those people you may never have had an interaction with before. So a connection call is a great way to learn about them and so that they can learn about your show and your format as well. Um, and connection calls are also another great way to communicate that time block that we talked about earlier. 
Number four is a tip that has to do with the structuring of your questions. I love to follow this framework uh, when I do my own interview. So first is to start with really generic questions, big, broad questions, and get more specific as you go in. This is a psychological trick, um, but it's also a way to to run an interview that makes a little bit more sense. So go from general questions down to the more specific. Now we want to uh, get to number three, which is to get into state. Uh, so if any of you guys who are listening today are uh, Tony Robbins fans, you've probably heard this term before. So getting into state has to do with setting your mind and your body uh, in a different speed is the way that I like to think of it. So instead of just sitting there in your calm working zone kind of fe brain feeling, um, instead, before my interviews, I get up, there's a little space behind my desk here, I get up and I do jumping jacks, I run in place for a little bit, and I say things to myself to help myself get psyched up and excited. That energy translates to the camera and it will also translate to your guest as well. If you have great energy, it'll be contagious and it'll help your guest as well. And the second or second to last tip is to make sure that you stay hydrated. When you're chatting and you're high energy in your interviews, that can cause a lot of dehydration. So make sure that you are drinking well ahead of time as well as having um, your liquids on uh, on your desk with you while you're doing your interview. And finally, the number one thing, if you're going to forget everything else I've told you in this top 10 list, I want you to remember this last piece, and that is to be curious. If you are genuinely curious, you don't have to pre-write questions. If you are genuinely curious, that you don't need to get into state because you're already there. Genuine curiosity is going to appease your guests. It's going to make them feel like they are a superstar. It's going to give better information to your audience because your audience is probably asking those same questions. So you as the interviewer have to be that conduit for curiosity for your people. So go out there. Be curious, and we'll see you on the other side. Oh, man. Okay, trying to get guests on your show can be a little bit overwhelming, can be a little bit scary. Uh, but today, I went back and I asked RJ to give us his ideas and his thoughts on what, what you should actually do to get guests on your show. So let's talk about how do you get guests on your show in three simple steps and a bonus. <laughs> so here's RJ with his step number one. So the number one thing is, first of all, getting clarity who your dream guest is. That is actually important for you to understand. Uh, I remember, like, you know, the reason I, I talk about my guests, because I have learned a lot of things from them during those uh, interviews. So one of my guests, Umar, you know, he, he told not every millionaire is equal. Some of them are ethical. Some of them are unethical. You know, some of them want to just go with their Lambos and all of these are the things. So you, who you are is what you attract. So you have to be clear on, who is your dream guest? First. Get really, really clear on who your guests are. So remember back at the beginning of this episode when I told you guys to write down that list? That's the list we're talking about. When you are clear on who your guests are, that's going to make this entire process so much easier. Let's get to RJ's step number two. First of all, the second thing you have to make sure is where they are super active on. Are they super active on Instagram? Are they super active on Facebook? Do they have their own community? And are they active over there as well? That's a really good point. I'm trying to stay hydrated, my friends. So let's dive into, now that we know where our guests are hanging out, where they're active, we're going to start serving value in their communities and whatnot. We also want to make sure that we are finding opportunities to start connecting. So let's see what RJ has to say about engaging and serving and the brilliant bonus that he gives us. So once you know the idea about where they are super active, then the third thing comes up is start to engage with them. You know, start to have a conversation with them, with their people out there, helping themselves, helping their people in any format of way. Don't think so 
that you have to be helping them in a way big manner out there in order to either you know get them on the show and this and that you can help them out you can serve and you can get them on the show now when you get them on the show if you make their experience better in a pretty good way they can even allow you to uh, get more doors for more guests out there as well they would love uh, to do introduction for you to other guests that could be potentially great fit for you if you actually willing to do that as well so that, that is also super powerful and this is a miniature kind of a walk through process which i'm talking about of how you can go in and get all of those people out there as well so now uh, once you got your uh, great guest or like someone who is making like bare minimum like seven figures it's easier to get a second yes as well because now they know uh, you have a quality of the guest that you got on the show because if someone want to be on your show and especially when you're doing it live live is something which uh, some people resist is because there is a trust factor that needs to be on to it since you're doing it live anyone can ask any question so it could pretty much like you know can mess it up so if you have that trustworthy staff they would love to be on your show they would love to talk about a lot of stuff out there as well so like that experience for that previous guest can help you get other guests as well and when you do it consistently people already know who you are before you even reach out to them smart stuff he's got to share with you guys so making sure that once we get that first guest we we feel super accomplished but we know that the battle is not over yet we always want to ask that guest if we've had a great time with them if they recommend or know anyone who would love to be interviewed as well as you're growing your business, you want to both bring people on to interview and to share their expertise with your audience, but you also want to make sure that your voice is getting out there as well. So it's a win-win for everyone. Today's hot tip, my friends, is to make sure that you are genuinely curious. Your genuine curiosity should come out in the ask when you're asking for people to be on your show. Your genuine curiosity should be woven through each and every one of your questions. And that curiosity should follow through with your follow-up as well in how you ask for new connections, in how you connect with your audience and you follow through with delivering that great information from your interview. Genuine curiosity, my friends, will not only serve you with great interviews, but it will also serve you when you're creating amazing content. And it'll also serve you as you go and grow your business. If you're asking truly authentic, genuine questions of your experts, you should start putting all of that information into practice as well. That's what's going to help change your business. Final thoughts for today's episode is to get out there and do it. I know so many of you listening right now are terrified of the idea of asking guests to be on your show. What happens if I slip up? What happens if I don't ask the right questions? What happens if they think my show is a little bit goofy? doesn't matter my friends what matters is that you find the people who don't care about those thoughts you find the people who are excited to share their message and share their journey with your people build genuine communities my friends be be, be extra curious and go make those connections I love you guys from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for checking out today's episode. I will see you again real, real soon. And well, in the spirit of asking for connections, if you have any awesome guests or if you would like to be a guest on the live show, definitely let me know down in the comments. I would love, love to build this community a bit more. Until I see you again, my friends, remember as per usual, I love you, be excellent to each other, and go build your connection machines. <laughs> <laughs>